Und am Nachmittag dann nicht. Okay. Und dann ja, komplett voll. Also meint es das online. Und genau, wir nehmen es auch. Okay. Ja, wir arbeiten auch schon nächstes Jahr auf mehr Workshops. Ja. Ich hoffe, dass wir nicht versuchen, dass du kommst, überhaupt was damit zu machen. Stimmt. Ist ja Winter. Stimmt. So, is everybody set? Okay, so um, in the uh, Windows or Mac? Mac? Okay. Let's forget about the second projector. Yeah, well, the way you would usually work with touch designer is with two monitors. It's highly recommended because obviously the interface eats up a lot of space. And um, if you work on video content, which I'm going to talk about now, it's basically how to use touch to render a 3D scene and to create video and to do post production and that more, uh, yeah. Rendering, compositing style uh, is very useful to have a second monitor on which you can see just your output. Unfortunately, this projector is dying after three seconds because the fan is blocked, so you can't do that. But if you have a workspace at home, it's very recommended to work with two screens. So I wanted to talk a bit about uh, how do you do a 3D render, how do you output it. Marcus has talked about that already a little bit, and how do you render movies and audio stuff to a file, how do you use it as a production tool. Um, <clears throat> in terms of how you actually make your output the right way with Touch Designer, it's just a few days ago Richard Burns has uh, released a YouTube video, Keeping in Touch for Getting Visuals to the Output. Uh, I highly recommend to see this video, it's not only explaining how you do it with touch designer, but in general, uh, how you should deal with multiple outputs and stuff, because what um, is easy to be forgotten is not only a question of touch designer, it's always like a two-part thing, you have to make your uh, 
the setup of your graphics card, uh, which allows you to have monitors cloned or have monitors next to each other or above or wherever. And if you want to use several monitors, you will have to set up from your graphics card first and then use touch to play into that setup. Um, just a short notice to that, uh, which may be useful for those of you who already work like that. Um, a graphics card, maybe Marcus says this wrong, but that's what I remember. A graphics card kind of always works with square textures. That's the natural way to be. So whenever you can arrange things in a square, that's the most effective. Let's say you have four projectors, you want them um, next to each other, like a big panorama picture then in the output, then it's still recommendable to have them internally as two in a row because that form is closest to the square. So you need a smaller texture to calculate all your screen real estate. Uh, the way they are in reality is anyway defined by where you point your projectors. It doesn't matter how it's inside the computer. Inside the computer it may be much more useful to have the one, two, three, four instead of one, two, three, four. As we only have one projector that can't really demonstrate just that. But more of that kind of stuff you find here in general, you could say uh, it's always advisable to have all your monitors at the same hertz rate. So if one is 60 hertz, then the next should be 60, they all should be 60. It's, all, it's better if they all have the same resolution. Like the more you can do things the same, the better the result will be. If you mix, for example, like a 50 hertz monitor with a 30 hertz monitor, uh, it will stutter. Whatever you do, and it's not that your computer is too slow. Mm -hmm. It's just because graphics cards can't do with that. Very simple. So, if you deal with outputs, this is very important to see that this is Nvidia. Um, I would say it's also highly recommended if you work with Touch Designer to work with NVIDIA cards because there's some more functions supported on NVIDIA cards. Um, so pretty much everyone I know who works professionally with Touch Designer works with NVIDIA. Um, then it's always recommended to do what most people do because then you get more support if you have a question than if you're the only one who's doing it on an exotic setup. Okay, that's just a little excurse. Uh, you will find the link in this file and just watch the video. It's definitely good. And it does take not a lot of time. Um, the way I organize this here is I build components. Um, basically, components are like nodes which hold already node networks. Um, this is a good way to organize things because especially if you work with different people because then different people can work with different components you can put all of that stuff together but every component is basically sort of like a node as inputs outputs has some parameters so that way you can also extend touch designer you've seen the palette these are basically all these kind of components which are already built by someone, they gave input, they gave parameters and output. Um, if you build components yourself, you can also add them to the, um, uh, to the palette for later reusing them by just dragging them there. So then in future, you can just drag your own prefabricated elements, something that you might use over and over, you just have to build it once and then you use it just as you would use a node. Um, one of those very basic things that you will find yourself doing over and over again is uh, making a 3D render setup. Um, well, you will find that in the first thing here I still made comments and then I somehow ran out of time. <laughs> so if you, in the next uh, it's not, there's not description anymore, but maybe you just want to take your own notes. Um, okay, what do we do have here? So, if we want to render a 3D geometry in space, we need uh, three components. Um, the first one is a camera, the second one is a geometry, and the third one is a light. 
Um, Where is the set coming from? Let's just. I mean, I'll also build it now. No. Um, it's just more for me as an orientation. So um, the thing is, if you want to lay down several nodes at once, you can do that. Um, you could just hold control and then select the nodes that you want. So in our case, we want a camera, we want a light, and we want a geometry node. So basically now they've been laid down. Uh, my ones are orange because they already refer stuff <coughs> that have them up here. I should turn all of them off. So why do we need all those three things? It's basically it's quite clear. We need geometry because that's what we want to look at later. So we need a thing that holds geometry that would be in Touch Designer a geometry node. You can have lots of these geometry nodes. Um, also, you, or you can have just one. Um, you need a light because uh, it's like in the real world, without light we couldn't see anything. We tend to forget that because we always have sunlight and stuff, but in a virtual world, if you don't turn on the light, you just don't see anything. Um, and the last thing that we definitely need is a camera, because the camera is our eyes. Um, all of these three things are 3D objects, so they have a position in space. Um, if you look at the camera, we see here different parameters, and the first page is this X form. That's what says how this geometry node is positioned in space. Uh, you see you have um, the classic 3D translates, they're called. You have translate, which is X, Y, and Z position. So X is on your screen axis, Y is up and down, and Z is into the depth of the space. In that case, the camera is on 5, a positive value on the X axis. So like, let's say, if I would be the camera, you would be the object, I would be a zero, you would be one, two, three, four, five, in depth, uh, Z values. Uh, the same is true for the light. Um, you see that it has slightly different positions uh, as default. Um, it makes sense that the camera is a bit back in Z axis because everything else is created at zero, so the camera will, in any case, see something. If the camera would also be at zero, it would always be stuck in the object that you create. Um, so all of those have this first page pretty much the same. Uh, you can say where they are in space, where they rotate, how they scaled. A uniform scale for all axes. Um, yeah, and if I move this geometry slightly to the right, we see that it's moving away. I'm not sure why I have two of those, <coughs> because all of this is here. This is just confusing. So, um, one thing that is actually quite helpful, but might be a bit confusing, is that in newer versions of Touch, there is something called auto-homing. So, uh, if I move this thing to the right, you see that it's actually been moved to the right of 3.2 units, but here is still in the center. That's because auto-homing, because this viewer here always looks at the object. Um, it has been moved nevertheless. Um, and that, um, that is somewhere... Ah, here. Okay, like we heard before, these nodes always have two states. They can be like this, or they can be active, which is uh, changed by this little star here. And when they're active, they have another right-click menu, and that is that one. Uh, this is now set to adaptive homing. If I turn it off and I move the geometry, 
should actually stay. So this is just to warn you of the confusion that it can cause. Usually it's actually good. Um, if you turn a view, uh, one of those things active, it's in viewer mode. Um, and that means that you are now looking into 3D space. And so we already saw before that you can navigate in these view spaces in an image, which just doesn't do very much. But here you have the same tools, you can move with uh, the right mouse click, you can zoom with the middle click, um, and you can tumble around the axis with the left mouse button. <coughs> if you tumble yourself in some weird position, you can always press H for home, um, and it will reset the viewer. Um, one thing to notice about the viewer, this is only works only basically inside the software. This is not yet a rendered image. This is just a preview that you see. Um, so now what do we need to make an image of that? Um, we need a renderer. The renderer is looking in the world, and whatever it sees, it turns into pixels. Um, to create that, you go to the top because the render node creates pixels out of something else, so it's part of the texture operators, and it's called render. Find it down here. As soon as I place it, some connections are being made. And that is because, per default, this renderer, where I look at the parameters here, it needs a camera, it needs geometry and it needs lights. So per default, it would be um, three stars here. Star is uh, a wild card that means anything. So if I say star here, it would try to render every camera. It can only render one camera, so it's probably going to be camera one, but this geometry that definitely works. If I have a star here, that means all the geometry nodes, wherever they are, they're going to be rendered by this render node. Um, I could also say, well, with this render, I only want to render this geometry because I might use another render for another geometry. Then I could just type in the name of the geometry. Now it only looks at that. Or the simpler version is you can just drag it here. It's in general a way that works very often. You can write things or you can just drag operators which will only work if it's the right kind of operator. So if I would uh, take, let's say, something like this here and drag it to where it expects geometry, nothing happens. So it can be a bit confusing, but you have to always be aware of what family you're actually talking about. What's the moving uh, arrow indicating and why are the others moving? In the line. Good question. So the, the arrows are indicating that information from here is flowing here, is used here. And I think that this means there is basically regularly checking what's going on there. So it's a renderer. We're running at 60 FPS. So the renderer looks 60 times a second at the geometry. Ah. So is there, is there an animation? That yeah, I'm not really sure why those are not animated. That would be more a question to Marcus. Uh, it doesn't really matter in a way. Um, some more things to consider about the render node is um, <clears throat> here you say what it renders. Then here you have anti-aliasing, which will be later interesting uh, because it kind of sets how nice your image looks, how nice the edges are calculated. And if you're rendering with a real-time software, it's basically always a question of balance. Like, you know, when you work, work with After Effects or with a traditional 3D software, you kind of have accustomed to, well, okay, then I have to wait one minute for the frame. It's fine. Just let it render overnight, look at it tomorrow, if it's shit, I do it again. Uh, if you're working with real-time rendering, 
that's not what you do. You're always looking at your output constantly. You don't have to wait. But if you do the wrong things in your setup, which need too much performance, your frame rate goes down. If it goes down to under the value that you need to keep up, um, then uh, you get obvious stuttering. So you always uh, have to have in mind how much load can I actually make on the system to still get the result that I need. Um, but actually you can go a long way before you have these frame rate problems. Uh, another charming thing here is the render mode. So right now we're rendering a 2D image, just normal, like we would do in a 3D software. Um, but there are different possibilities. There's a cube map that would be basically a 360 degree image that a camera sees in all directions uh, laid down as a cube um, to basically the four sides of the cube looking in the six directions from the camera which then later could be used uh, to render 360 degree images by converting that, or could be used as a reflection map inside the scene. Um, you have fish eye, which is like a, a 180 degree view of a thing, and um, very nice only in the experimental builds right now, but probably has a great future is UV unwrap. Um, which might be familiar from those of you who work with 3D software. It gives you the possibility to take the texture of a 3D object, the mapping, and make it flat. That way you can then work on it with Photoshop, blah, 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 and then you put it back on the 3D object. So again, but this is very new. I don't have any experience with it, but um, it's quite exciting that this exists now, just so you've heard about it. Um, The rest is basically not so important uh, for us now. Always important is the comment tab, because that's where you set the resolution of your render. And in general, um, it is highly recommended to be always conscious about the resolution that you work in. Because a lot of beginner mistakes are actually caused by that you don't really look, um, because here is a small screen, and then you might have like a 4K image, and you make may have one which is just that small, you mix them, weird things happen. Uh, always be aware in which resolution you work. <clears throat> and that's what you can change here. Um, what you also can do in Touch Designer, this is also a bit more experty, but I mention it here because later it gives lots of possibilities. Uh, what we're very used to is dealing with 8-bit images. So you have 8-bit per channel. That means how much data can be consumed by a channel. Uh, that also says how many colors you can have, for example. You know, back in the 80s with the computer games, you had 16 colors because you had very low bits. Uh, what we usually work with in Photoshop and so on is 8 bit per channel, but you can go as high as 32 bits per channel, which then becomes very interesting if you want to pack other data in the form of an image and use image to transport data. With a 32-bit image, you can uh, transport huge amounts of data in comparison to an 8-bit image. Okay, so now we've got this rendered image here that will be updated now 60 times a second. Uh, yeah, 60 times a second. Um, maybe also one thing to consider, uh, we're here in Germany. That means our power system runs at 50 hertz. That means also TV cameras run at 50 frames per second or 25 frames per second, which is different than in the American world where stuff is running at 60 hertz. Uh, that means you don't have to care about that. It's much easier to work with 60 hertz, but as soon as you make an installation and television comes in, or any German media which works with motion image, uh, you run your stuff at 60 hertz, they film at 50 hertz, it gets really ugly artifacts. Uh, you know, these running images and so on. So uh, if you make something for the German market and there will be publicity, you should go for 50 hertz. Um, because then it's in sync with the light and the power system and everything. And, and the TV stations. Um, 
So basically now we're rendering this image. Um, if we want to view this image view at the same time, um, it's good to place a mo because Marcus is watching and he always insists that we have to put a mo somewhere. So the mo, as the name already says, does nothing. Uh, but then it's very nice to add an out. <coughs> and the out is basically how you yourself can create these inlets and outlets for nodes. So if I look outside of that component, I see that I created an outlet here. And that is because I put an out node here. If I put two out nodes here, I get two outputs. Um, we're not going to use it, but I could also place an in. If I want to feed an image from somewhere else. So now my node also has an input. So now I have a node with one input and two outputs. Basically, I could use that already somewhere prefabricated. Um, I thought you, sorry, you didn't mention that with, uh, when navigating quickly, I chose the model to the open part. You also can use the U key to go up the level and the I key to go down the level. <coughs> Yeah, maybe also worth mentioning that it is always good to keep this path here in mind because sometimes it's easy to forget where you are, how deep you are, but it's like a hierarchical level. So you can always see I'm now inside that node here. I can also click here to go up to that level. Um, or if I go in here, you, know, you see the path here. So this always gives you the overview how deep you are down in the hierarchy and gives you a quick jump to go up and back down. So now I see the preview of the rendered image here on this component. That may not be the case with you. Um, and the way you set this up is that every component has on this comment tab here in the very right, there's here a parameter called node view. It can be on default viewer, and it can be on operator viewer. Default viewer would be useful if you would have interface elements in there, because then that would put turn into like a user panel, where you could have clicks and pages and stuff that you design for a user. Or you can just look at one of the nodes inside. Um, so if I go here to operator viewer, Per default, it looks here at dot slash out one. Um, if you're familiar with uh, web and stuff, you know that dot slash always means go inside, whereas dot dot slash would mean go one up. So if I say dot slash out, that means go inside myself and look at out one. So that will then be used as a preview here, and if I drag that whole container onto my window component. It will be now on my output window, which ideally would be on a second monitor. Um, if you can't have a second monitor, you can still make it quite small um, and have it just as a floating window. And you can also resize these windows and put them like in a little corner so you always see what's them. The scaling, what's the scaling for you? Just, just. Um, that one? Mm -hmm. Interesting for Mac users, you can actually grab all the corners. Okay, and so basically this is also what you would send to your projector or to your monitor or wherever. However you set up windows. Um, so the next thing to, uh, so and if you, if you don't have a second monitor, there's also like a, a shortcut to see 
more bigger what a certain node does. And that is if you look closer at the nodes, you see they have these little dots here. And if I turn this uh, blue dot on, this will automatically be in the background. <clears throat> so I can see this output always while I'm working, even if I'm not looking at it. That only works for these, in that constellation, for these uh, texture operators. You can also have several of them, and they will be arranged in the background. So let's keep this one open. Um, so the next thing we probably want to do is we don't want to look just at this uh, very boring color. So we want to give a material to a 3D object. Uh, and for that, you have um, a special category of nodes, it's the material nodes. There is a fairly long list of materials, but um, you're basically going to end up mostly using the foam, which is like a traditional 3D material, which can be shiny, which can be not so shiny, and so on. Uh, you might be interested in the wireframe, which gives you just the wireframe of an object. Um, and then if you go in a bit deeper, you might be interested in PBR materials, which are kind of state-of-the-art computer game uh, material model, uh, which is, yeah, it gives you a bit more possibilities to play this material, to get a bit more realistic or also a bit more subtle, these materials. Uh, for now, we're just going to use the phone. So you create a phone material, and um, again, there are several ways to apply that now to the torus, which is inside the geometry node. So basically, you can give materials to geometry nodes, and then all the geometry in that geometry node will have that material. If you want another material, you have to make another geometry node with another material. They will all live in the same 3D world, you just have this geometry node to control them. Um, so there's one actually a question that I have since 15 20 minutes. So even if they are not connected to each other, just playing as nodes there, the light, the camera, the object, and the object two, the object three, so they are in one space. They exist, like they have a connection to each other without having a connection over the nodes. Yeah, they're all living in the same same CD space. Yeah. Um, there are different possibilities, like you could say this render only sees that geometry, yeah. doesn't see that one, you can hide them from each other, but in the end they're all in the same space. So I have uh, many objects and just lay them next to each other and they exist in the same world. Yeah. So I don't have to combine them by a node. No, I mean you could combine, link them up in the sense of when I move geometry one, all the others move, you can build hierarchies. Um, but in general, you don't have to connect them in a crazy way or something. Yeah, if they're to be like an image word that I would say like combine add whatever, that I don't say like merge in this case like one object with the other in the same place. There are functions like that in the soft world, but in general, you don't need that. So this material has basically the same properties that most materials in the 3D world have. Um, most important one is the diffuse color. That's what we would traditionally just say is the color of the thing. But we should change that so that we see when we apply it that it actually happened. Um, and a lot of other things. Maybe I just mention a few. Um, alpha is always in the 3D world or compositing world transparency. An alpha channel would be a black and white image telling which parts are transparent and not. So here I can uh, basically make the material transparent. Um, what I love very much is a rim. Just showing it to you because I find it quite cool because it fakes light effect. So with rim light, I can say um, 
Oh, there's like a nice green light coming from this angle. And this happens without any light involved. So it's not a real light, it's just giving you a nice possibility to make them look a bit more complex by just playing with uh, different rim lights. Uh, the disadvantage is they will totally not react really to the real lights and so on, they just take these. That's what makes them so good because in the end we are artists, uh, even if we work with a technical tool, we are happy about everything that helps us cheating. Like never be afraid of cheating if it leads to a nice result. Okay, rim lights. Other settings, an interesting page is here the common. Um, if you want to work with transparencies in a material, you have to turn it on here, no matter what you already did there. And then it can still be a bit confusing because transparency in this software doesn't work like you used to it from 3D software or from After Effects. There's like a whole long article in the help which explains exactly how it works. We don't need to touch it here, it's just when you work with transparency and several objects which are stacked in space and they totally don't do what you expect naturally, then it's time to go into the help and read about transparency and touch design. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> You're going to know the moment when you need that. Um, so how do we apply this material now to this geometry node? As always, we have several possibilities. One would be I just drag it onto it and drop it. Then it gives me all the possibilities that this material could go to. And we want to put it on the parameter material. Um, if you look at the geometry node now, you see it has here a tab called render. And that's where it eats the, the material. So it has written here from one because I dragged it there. I could just as well go there and just write it. It doesn't really matter. So. That's a stupid that I deleted the notes before because there was one more thing that I wanted to do here. Um, I mean, you can play around a bit with navigating in that 3D space. Uh, I mean, you can always navigate stuff through the viewer. If you do that with a light or with a camera, you're actually moving them in space. So you see here now I changed the rotation. But it's not very recommended to do that because uh, it creates these crazy results. And um, it's always recommended to, to work numerically because it can be very confusing. Suddenly you don't see things anymore because you made a stupid move. Uh, you created all these crazy numbers. Uh, it's very hard for your brain to understand where stuff actually is. That's why um, I would recommend to move stuff only one axis at a time, um, and I always think about am I moving Z, am I moving Y, am I moving X, and, and doing that in a very controlled way because the space is endless. Um, the same is true for the light, and if I now um, move my camera, for example, to the Right, we will very quickly lose sight of the torus because we don't look at the torus anymore. Um, the beginning, there's like quite simple workaround to always have your camera looking at your object, so you can't really get confused. And that is uh, that all of these objects have a look at parameter, and that does exactly what the name says. Whatever object you place here will be looked at by the camera. Same is true for the light. It also has a look at parameter. Um, so the target of the light or the camera will always look at that object that we place here. And you may have guessed it. We can either drag the object there on the slot or we can write it. 
So if I want the camera to always look at the, this geometry, I just drag the geometry here and it writes geo2. In the instance of the light, I could also just write it there. Yes, I want you to also look at geo2. Hmm. So now if I start moving the camera, no matter where I put the camera, I will always keep looking at the object, which is, I think, a pretty good condition for us now at our state. And the same is true for the light. I can move it in different directions, but it will always keep the object inside. So this is the first basic render setup, how you uh, set up a 3D world, how you render a pixel image out of that, um, and then how you send it out of the node. Can you add there, how you would add another object there? Um, I could either jump into the geometry node, where we find a sub-operator, which is the actual surface we're looking at. This is just the touch designer default content of a geometry. Um, again, you have a viewer and so on. You have uh, different properties of this object. Like, this is stuff that I couldn't do on the geometry node. The geometry node is basically just a position in space and I translate information. Oh. The real surface, the mesh, is always inside there. Um, if I want another object with the same material, I could just lay it next to that. Let's ah. say I want to make a box. Yeah. Inside there. Yeah. Now, there's one thing to consider. Um, oh, yeah, the same position. They are now in the same position because these things, yeah, they also have position. So the inputs are all applied to both geometries. Exactly. Yeah, the, the, the geometry node is like a bag. You can carry around that bag. And in that bag, we have now a torus in the box. Um, and then outside, I can choose which one. No, no, no. But outside, if you look now um, at the geometry node, to our surprise, the box is not there. Even so, we put it inside. And that brings us again to these little so-called flags. There's the blue one is the display flag. So if I turn that off, then I don't see anything in the viewer because none of the objects has an active display flag, so they're just not seen by the viewer. Um, the other one, this purple one, that's the render flag. That means the object should be rendered by the camera. If I turn that off as well, they're not in the viewer and they're not seen by the camera because none of the flags are on. So I'm saying this because it's also a very popular uh, mistake to make all your geometry, but there's no render flag, so they're just not going to be rendered. So these two dots are actually important. If I turn them off for both objects, you will see on the outside, A, you see both objects in the display, and the renderer sees both objects. Um, so they're still in the same position, same space, but they might not be displayed, they might not be rendered. If I wanted to have more geometry, even at the same space but in another color, I could just copy that set, um, change the color of this material to something ugly, and then they would be there. I might not see them because they're overlaying each other, because they're now in exactly the same position. Funny enough, you see that here, the camera sees this one here, prefers to be this one and this one, and the light prefers to see it the other way around. There is no reason to that, I think, because they're exactly in the same spot. 
Yeah. Can you do this again? Apply different materials to different. Oh, you have to copy the geometry as well. Well, one geometry can only have one material. Okay. So if I want something in another material, I um, have to give it a new material. Hmm. And then I choose which one I render. Yeah, now you could say here, oh, I only want to render geometry one. Uh, or in my case, geometry two, or I only want to render geometry three, or I want to render all geometry. Then it would be useful to scale one of them so you can actually see that it's two of them. Or you can just uh, also write a list of them. So later it will, it will be quite useful to feed something like that, for example, with a script. Then you can choose different things at different times, which are all floating around the same space. Okay. Where do we get the geometry from? Uh, like everything, I mean, I prefer to open this menu by double clicking. Uh, that's awesome. But you could also do tab. And then all these geometry like blah 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 things they're here in the first. Well, I mean the, the objects which you have. So. Because I only have the stone option. Like, it's the same. Okay. Yeah, because I was right in there and I basically here these blue ones, lots of them create three D objects. Some of them are more meant combine several of them to come to a 3D object, but here you find classics like the sphere okay, or the so box. What, what is, like, if I like the border OBJ file, for example, what kind of, uh, I, I would also place the OBJ uh, into the, the uh, yeah, I, note, huh? and what is the, the geo node and what is the input for it? Yeah, let's make this excursion because I think that's a uh, Gonna come up more and more. Is not super obvious. I just made um, it by hand, like dropped it into it. So it yeah, so like that's basically the easiest so way, but it has some caveats. Well, um, what is the name of the node actually? If I have a 3D, yeah. let's say I have here. Um, I have here an FBX that I have downloaded somewhere. Um, Actually, little Windows tip, if you know 3D paint on Windows, if you want to have a simple 3D model to, paint, to play with, a touch designer, you open 3D paint, which is a software on Windows, and it has a huge object library, and from there you can export the objects to FBX, you drag and drop them in touch designer, they work immediately, and they're all for free, and really nice. Um, so, okay, if I take now an FBX, like I could download it from the net, uh, I drag and drop it into Touch Designer. It will actually create a geometry node. But then it becomes interesting if you look inside that geometry node because it reproduces the hierarchy in which it's handled in the original 3D software. So, oh. so this it can become quite endless. In there's everything inside, like camera, shader, So this is basically the, the object from the library with textures. If I go inside, I see, okay, there's a root, and there's a folder with textures. If I follow root, there's another ID, another node, geometry node, then there are several nodes in there. In that, there are several nodes, in which there are several nodes. <laughs> At some point, you will have the actual mesh, and the material, and the maps that feed those material. Um, you see all these weird values, so basically a lot of these geometry nodes are stacked into each other in a regular 3D model. Actually, my, my, my question was just, if you have an OBJ without any textures on it, so something that you just created, or just to manipulate there, uh, but I uh, found that it's the file in you know, you just create the geometry, oh, a file in node, and then you load the OBJ on your... That, that would be a possibility, or 
the thing what I wanted to tell is if you do this drag and drop thing, yeah. you will have this here, but it might then happen very often. You save your scene. If you open it the next time, this review file isn't there anymore. Yeah. And that's because when you drag and drop it, it automatically creates an import folder in the directory where this touch designer file lives now. And in there is all the maps and also the um, geometry data of the FBX. So if you do this in an untitled scene, you drag it in, everything's nice, then you save it. Then the file might move to another position. Will all the link will lose the links to the geometry because it's actually not inside Touch Designer, but it's loading different meshes. Okay. But once you get used to it, it's definitely possible to import very complex 3D models. Sometimes it takes a while for this process, but then you can actually work quite fluidly with them. Also with yeah. also with yeah, you can. There's a blend. Thing, so you can have different states of a mesh and you can blend with them. And I haven't used it yet, but there is also a lambic import, which I think is a whole animation in 3D that you can import. Yeah. Uh, fancy stuff like that. Only the grades those stats. You don't you don't necessarily create them in that complexity. It's more like touch designer shows you how they're actually handled in the 3D studio or something, where you have this complex hierarchy. It's just hidden to you as a user. That's why it no, can be. I, I could do it myself too. I could take 10 nodes and then how can I stack them together? Well, you just put them into each other. Like here, this is the, the main node. Now, with, this, with this, we can uh, move around everything that is inside together. But if you go deeper inside, we come down to the single parts. So here I could move only the tires. Um, without consequence for the rest, just the tires relatively to the rest. You see now they move to the side. Uh, so what it also means is you can, uh, with these components, you can Put a component and a component and a component and a component and a component. There's no end to it, basically. Not always useful, but sometimes very useful if you want different hierarchies of what can you move how. So that's what happens if you import to the object. Um, is that clear so far? Should we move to the next step? So the next one would be a bit more advanced render setup. So uh, we have more fun and we can learn a few new things. Uh, if you don't want a node to be calculated, you just uh, you can use this, or uh, how Touch Designer says cooking. Uh, you can just disable cooking for this one, and then it will not be calculated anymore. Um, So what you should do is you take this node with the basic render setup and you just make a copy of it uh, with which we then gonna make the steps that I pre-made here. Um, just check what I did here. So for this advanced render setup, we're gonna try two or three more advanced techniques, which are more complicated. That's why they're called advanced, but they're also much more fun. Um, so let's reduce that maybe back to one geometry only. And let's also delete the Toro, so we're only dealing with this box. Um, one thing that is immensely popular with all uh, touch designer users is a thing called instancing. And it's definitely a bit difficult to understand, but because it's so much fun and it's one of the most important techniques in real time, uh, we're going to use it in a, in a light way. So right now we have one cube in space. Uh, what would be much more interesting if we would have 64 cubes in space arranged in a nice pattern. 
like instancing allows you that basically is a very uh, not performance consuming way of dealing with thousands of objects. Um, and the way it works is that you have a geometry, and a geometry always consists of points. And then you say, for every point that geometry has, I want to put another geometry to that point. Uh, let's think of a strawberry. You know, strawberry, there's all these seeds. You could do that with instancing, because one seed is much like the other seed. You just say, well, put on every dot of that strawberry, put a seed. That's how instancing works. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a grid of cubes with which we can play. So what we first need to do is create that grid so we get the points. You can do that by going to the sub-operators, the blue ones, and pick a grid. So this doesn't look very much like a grid because it's already shaded as a surface lays here somewhere around in 3D space. And to see what the actual mesh is, and you can press W. W will give you a wireframe look. If you don't like shortcuts, you can also access that through this right-click menu. And you could toggle between shaded and wireframe. Um, I tend to always look at my geometry first as wireframe because then I actually know well how many points is this made up from. And points are actually really important, I find, for dealing with 3D and touch designer. And what is also helpful to have that orientation about your geometry and your points is, again, if you right-click here, go to Display Options. You have different stuff that you can turn on. So if you turn on points here, you see that you now get a blue dot on every point. You could also turn on this one. Um, this will then tell you the point number. So because each of these points has a number, which we can use for all kinds of things. You could also um, use this one. It shows you the normals. Normals are also a very 3D thing, because in 3D space, usually surfaces only exist in one direction. And that's the direction the normal goes to. But if this would be a 3D object, then the normal would be orthogonal to that. And that's why we can see it. On the other side, it wouldn't be there, because the normal goes in that direction. Um, so here you see the normals. Then you can um, have the UV coordinates. They basically tell you how a texture would be placed on that. We don't have any UV coordinates yet. And you can have the X, Y, Z value, which gets very excessive very fast, but that would give you the exact coordinate of every single point. These coordinates are always expressed with three values, X, Y, Z. So this is, it. This is the position in space of that point. This. Mm, no, I think that is then some more trickery to get this actually in the render. But this information that is in the model, and you can view it here, there are certainly ways to get it out and to place a text surface there which reads then this info, but this is advanced stuff. There's no simple way to get this out. Yeah, there's one simple way. Um, the, uh, up the up view, yeah. Which basically, you can, you can put any, it takes any operator and make it a texture. So, you just render. Um, but I would almost consider the up view cheating, but like you said before, <laughs> cheating is uh, allowed. It's very, yeah, it's very useful for if you have. Uh, Yes. So what the op viewer does is you can feed it any operator and then it will render what is in the preview of that operator. So now if we turn on the points here, um, they will show up in this render of the op viewer.
Ja. Um, no, it's, it's a texture operator because it turns something else into a texture. So it's purple top here. Okay, but <coughs> that is, I would call that a bit of an exception. So we should not deal too much with it right now. Um, <coughs> but it's definitely a nice exception, especially if you want to have nice curves and stuff. There's, there's always a way to also render them and make them really nice so you can have much more influence in them. But a very easy way is always to use the op view. So okay, now what we want to do is we want to place a copy of that of a box to each of those points. We know now that we can find out where all these points are. Um, we also learned that whatever we export, we should do it from a null. So we add a blue null. And now we can go to this geometry node, and you will see that it has an uh, instance tab here. Um, you have to turn this instancing on, and then you have a field here in which you can instance, uh, in which you can give basically the information where the instances should be placed. You can do that in several ways. You could use that as job data as that data, which would be like a table of positions, or you can just use geometry. And that's what we're going to do. So we drag this null onto here. And as soon as we feed something in here, all this becomes unlocked. So what is all this? This is basically, um, again, these transform parameters of the objects. Um, and if you look here on the right, with this error, we now have a list of things in here. P0, P1, P2, and N0, N1, N2. This stands for these points. So the position of this point consists of an x, y, z value. And if I read that out, is going to be called P, P0, P1, and P2, like a vector. Um, so let's say we want to place this cube on each of these points. <clears throat> then what we have to do is to give this cube here the position x, y, that, which it gets from that node, from these point positions. So we pick here P1, P0 for x, P1 for Y and P Z, P2 for Z. And now we should have more boxes here. Yeah. Well, it doesn't look very impressive yet because the box in here has a side length of one. And the grid also has a side length of one. So now it's creating all these boxes in this very tiny space defined by the grid, so it looks like one box. But now, because we've been good and we've been using a node to export, we just add a transform node here. You can do that if you uh, go over one of those proper wires, they become yellow, and if you right-click it, you can insert an operator. And we're going to take a transform. So now this geometry is generated, goes into this transform node, which allows us to manipulate position and scale. And now if we scale this up, we see how our cubes here unfold in a way. And we can scale it up even further until we see there's actually a grid made up of single cubes. So the reason why everybody in real time loves this is because for the computer, for some kind of magic, I don't know why, but this is still just one cube. Um, if you would do this by hand, let's say by copying this cube sub 
280 times, your performance would already go down. But if you use instancing, you're good to go for another few thousands of them. Can you, what's the connection with the export between the number of the channel Yeah. This one? Yeah. Okay, the geometry has here an instance yeah. tab, and it's, I drag this node here. Yeah. And that means that all the positions of all those points here are now available as P0, P1, P2. This may sound like only one value, but actually this means all the values of all the dots here. Uh, this becomes maybe a bit more confusing, but also clear at the same time. When we look how a touch designer converts nodes in, uh, between the families. So now we see a bunch of points in space that are mesh. But we could also go and convert this into a chop. So if I drag out from this node and press tab um, and go to chop, suddenly there's only two more nodes. And that's because that's the only two nodes I can actually, uh, chop nodes that I can connect to a geometry. Everybody else will not deal with this. Um, one of them is the info chop, which is super useful because it just gives you info about stuff, about everything, basically. So if you look at that, this says us, oh, this geometry we're just looking at consists of 400 points. That is, because this is 20 rows and 20 columns, so we get 400 points. If you look at this in a different way, by again selecting a chop, the only other one that we have, the soft two chop, we suddenly get this, and this is worth to think about a little bit, because this is now exactly the same thing, just in another representation. So we have the x value, so basically, you think about it, we have 400 points, right, in a grid. So now this chop has 400 samples. That means every point in that grid is one vertical line here, 400 times, 400 samples. Um, now if I look at the first line, I get the x, the y, and the z value of the first point. If I look at the second line, I get the x, the y, and the z value of the second point. So it's kind of interesting to think about why this looks like that. For example, why is the x coordinate like a zigzag? Because I have this grid and it has 20 points, so um, the x value goes up because I move in the x direction 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, until 20. Um, then I have reached my row, so I go back to the first x value, back to zero. And that's what's happening here. So this is basically the horizontal lines going up in the value, and then the next line comes. The y values uh, are just increasing lightly, because we're looking at it from the x direction. So this is like our 20 points, and the first 20 points are in the line, so their y values are always the same. The next line is a bit higher, so it gets a higher y value. And the z value, doesn't do anything because our plane lives in the x and the y. So there's no change in the z axis. It seems like there are two different views of chops. Um, this one, which has three colors and three channels, and uh, x, y coordinates, and uh, another one which has just one channel, uh, like. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a difference in the LFO versus the wave. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not that direct. So basically, you could have hundreds of those channels, and then they would get all different colors. 
Yes, but is, uh, why, why does it have two uh, why does it have y with uh, x and y coordinates? Maybe yeah, because we we are converting a 3D geometry which is defined by three values per point. I don't mean, I don't mean the points. I mean the channel of them. Yeah. It's a it's a grid. It's a um, graph. Why why is this channel of it a graph while other channels are just numbers? I'm not sure I understand. So what this does is basically just representing these points. Well, I think the question is, so the SOC2 has, like, yeah, has a graph, a channel graph, and the, the info chart on the left side of yes, the has a bar graph. Yeah. Ah, so, yeah, okay, so yeah. So is there the difference? Well, the, this one has 400 samples. This one has just one sample. So this shows you, you could also think of this as time if you wanted to, then this would show a development over time, whereas this would be just one moment of time. As soon as uh, the info uh, would have, yeah. I, if I would only look at only one of those points, it would look actually like that. So this turns into this as soon as there is more than one sample. Um, simple example would be. Okay. Something like this. This is basically only happen in one moment. In, in touch designer speech, that would say it's time sliced. So the only, it only exists always in this moment. When I connect this to a trail, this will look at it over 250 samples. And then it looks like that. Yeah. But this represents basically just this one line here. That's the difference. Okay, so just to to uh, ride around a bit on this on this point with the points so right away. Uh, another way to look at this would be to look at it as a dot. So I could also do a sub to dot. Now I look at the same geometry, but as a table, like an Excel table. And you see again we have the same things. These are the numbers of our points from 1 to 400. This is their P0, X position, Y position, Z position. And these are the normals, which we are using at the moment. And what we do when we do instancing, we basically take this row of values, and position other objects onto that. This is a bit difficult to understand at the beginning, it's also not so important that you completely understand it, but it shows one thing which is very fascinating and powerful about touch designers, that you can take these things into the different worlds. So this one lives in a world where I could turn this easily into music. This could be the control of a synthesizer. This one lives in a world where I could easily take it into an office software. And this one lives in a world where I can easily use it in a 3D software. But it's all the same thing. Yeah. <coughs> yes. Yeah, you convert can convert pretty much every operator into other operator families. If I do like uh, the grid uh, number four in the input, it will do something to the, to the geometry, or I can't. Yeah. Yeah, for example, I mean, this is a bit too far for us today, but you, you could also go and write a title like that in Excel, uh, and import it, and then say, oh, I want to point at every of these coordinates and please connect them. And then you would get, again, a geometry. And a grid will give me the point immediately. Yeah. So it's just different ways to look at. But what it essentially is, is positions in space. That's the important point that I'm trying to make. And we are using these positions in space now to create a script of 
It's cute. And to have even more fun with it, we could add another node, which uh, will help us to animate, to change these positions in time. And that would be by inserting a noise. So what the noise does is creates a, a pseudo-random pattern. And here we see that the noise works on the point position at this moment. And we can see that each of the points is now moving slightly in space, and thus also our instances. If you play with the parameters of the noise, you can change that behavior. Let's say we want to make it much more can you big. Go closer again to the, um, to the function right now, to the, to the noise, just the connection, it's stacked here for the grid, yeah? Yeah. Now, well, I sent the grid through the transform, and ah, then, yes, noise. then through the noise, and then to the node. So then I click right click mm -hmm. on the transform, Okay. Now you could yeah. just go in between until the cable is yellow, then right click and say insert operator. Can you also right click on the output of the three? If you right click on the output of the three, so yeah. Yeah, you could. Is, uh, yeah, I think if I would do that, which I never use. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, that's, that's really good. It's, in the end, there's like five ways to do it, and everybody has then at some point their favorite. What noise um, yeah, Well, there's here on the second, there's a, the choice between the different algorithms. In this case, um, sparse. So, noise is, a, is an extremely popular tool to make animations in Touch Designer. Once you got familiar with noise, you will understand the last 10 years of media art a bit better. <laughs> um, but it's a very nice way to create that pseudo-random, lively uh, animation. Okay, so now that we've got like a, a tiny bit more interesting image, uh, we can start looking at a bit um, eye candy. So far. I put the noise also onto the object, so the whole object is now moving and the... Uh, uh, that's right, but the thing is that with the instance it's not so much fun to make animation inside here because the same animation will apply to all the objects. But let's not get too deep in instancing, but in general later you can animate every single object, but it means you have to do it with channels, and that's a bit of mind fact how you get the channel information right to the node to the cube that you want. We will not cover that today. You had a question? So now let's see what else we can do. What did I have to But there's different algorithms. Each of these algorithms uh, creates a slightly different kind of noise. Um, maybe also interesting again to look at this, how would this look as a chop? This is how our points look after we applied the noise. So now you see nothing is happening to the X and to the Y. The noise only works on the Z axis.
How is this called a sub two one? What is this? In this is a the brief explanation of the that we just read. How is this called? This one? Huh? Yeah, this is the sub two. But it's not under subs. What is No, no, it's not under subs. It's ah, like yes. the, the easiest way to get to it is if you drag from a sub. When you say, I want to convert this to a chop, then it will only offer you basically where it comes from. Yeah, where it wants to go to. Uh, same would be if you now look at top, it will only offer you the up viewer because that's the only top that can deal with this knowledge. But which shortcut do I use when I drag if I drag just from, from the sub to, to nothing? Um, just Drag and then I basically click here, then I drag, then I have the wire, yeah. and then I use tab. Ah, tab, okay. I like, like, just going to the operator. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, you're coming up, yeah. it's getting you free from the noise, huh? Yes, that will work in my Now that we got this, um, we could now play a lot with slide and materials and so on. It becomes a bit uh, tedious. So um, I think I would right jump into uh, what kind of effects we now can apply to our rendered image. Because the one thing is, yes. Uh, you can do a lot during rendering, uh, but if you're more advanced, you will also find that there is also a lot that you can do in post-production. For example, it can be quite difficult to get the right color through a 3D rendering, but you can change the color afterwards through effects. So, um, let's look at a few things that we can do to post-process this whole thing. Is this a random color for a bridge like this? Mm -hmm. A random color? It's more difficult, I have to build it. Then, uh, so if you want to have every cube a different color, huh. yeah, that's again, you can individualize every one of those objects, but for that you have to learn how to encode this information in this format. Huh and then send it in. Like right now we already have like an individual set position for every cube. Yeah. The same way you have to find a way to pack your RGB data in the same format in these 400 samples and then so basically you can individualize everything, every parameter is here in the list. That would be translate, rotation, scale, pivot and on the second page you then get um, Stuff like texture, mode, or colors. Ah. I could have taken the vertex numbers for example and put them into. I mean, you can play around with it. So, right now, you could take the x position and map it to r, the y position, map it to and this to that. And now you get this um, RGB coloring of the things, depending on where they nice. are in space. <laughs> Uh, you can also later give every cube an individual texture no. and so on, but this is all a bit tricky. This is like a whole workshop. Yeah, what like, numbers do you with like? No, when you create it, so there's always that like every cube has a has number, and then somehow getting this this, this numbers into that uh, random become. Exactly. Yeah. Well, the way is again, <laughs> you have to build a set of channels like this. Uh -huh. For all the parameters that you want to control, and then you can use them here. But we're not going to go any further than this today. Um, some more, um, a bit of eye candy is what I actually want to do. So let's maybe uh, zoom out a bit with the camera to so get a better view. Let's do something which has a strong perspective, so we have like a, a big difference between things which are close to the camera and things which are far to the camera. 
Um, by just. Oh, okay. Changed in the geometry, huh? Geometry. Uh, in this, uh, that, that way you do the instancing. You have all these channels. And basically, you can feed your inputs. You always can choose out of those values. Not all of them have a good effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's add something uh, which I find quite nice, uh, which gives it immediately like a bit more extensive look, I call it. Um, the first effect I want to show you, this is really just a post-processing filter, it's called Edge. So if you right-click here, insert an Edge operator. Edge. Uh, after the render. So basically now we're doing post-processing stuff after the rendering. So this is a filter which just finds edges in the image. Uh, it's not smart, it doesn't know anything about the image, it just looks at the contrast or it could look at transparency or it could only look at red, green, whatever. It has some, some parameters with which you can play, which say how strong it applies. And uh, down here you have comp over input. If you turn that on, these outlines will now be overlaid on the image that we already rendered. And now let's add some depth, depth of field to the whole thing. And we can do that by dragging from here. Maybe I should turn the background on. Dragging from the render. I create a depth node. This is uh, also a very nice ongoing um, bug. This is the only operator which doesn't show up if you write his name. So you actually have to know where it is. It's down here. Depth. Hmm? Oops. Must like this. Wrong. Wrong. You don't have to drag it. Just create a depth node. Uh, the depth node doesn't show us anything at first. Um, because here it expects an operator. And I happen to know that the operator it expects must be a render, which we have here. So we can just drag this and feed it to the depth, which then turns white. Still not very exciting. <coughs> But then if we go, we say here pixel format, we change this to a normal texture, 8-bit, fixed RGB. We change this to rearrange from camera space. And then we start seeing something. And now if we play with this ranges, we can use this to get like a depth information of that image. And the goal is to get like areas where you don't have any white and areas where the cubes are already eaten away by white. So well, technically what this does is it creates a depth buffer. So it looks from the camera and then things which are close are rendered in transparent, things which are further away are rendered in white. So we get depth information in addition to our image. Now we can use this to do all kinds of uh, nice effects. For example, we could just composite this over our rendering by using a composite node. Remember, that was the one where Marcus also added the two circles together. The one which can eat 9,999 sources. 
you can think of this composite node like a Photoshop. Basically, it's like your layers in Photoshop. So if I add the step map to this composite node, then the first thing that's happening is looks like this. This is because the default operation is multiply. Uh, we want to change this to add. Because now what happens is that we kind of have a fog in the room. The further the objects are away from the camera, they disappear in this white fog. There's one use that we can make with the steps information. Yeah, so the depth node is created here, depth, and then it wants to have an operator here, and the operator it wants is render, because that holds the depth information, and you can... I don't create a connection, I try it 10 times now, like mm -hmm. the way like right click for the render and uh, just choosing depth that is actually not highlighted, it's dark. Yeah, it's so a I dark. create it and I have no connection. So I try it 10 times, I don't know what I yeah. did wrong. Well, because this is not one, it doesn't really have an input, don't ask me why, but it expects that you feed something in here. So you could just go and say render one. Uh -huh and the connection is there, or you can just drag it onto it. Yeah, then it's quite wide, <laughs> then I need to change this one here to the second one, and I need to change this one here also to the, to the third one. And then I have this range with which I, uh, which has to be, you know, now it's from one to thousand, but my cubes are only in a range from one to four hundred, basically, in this thing of the camera. So this is a bit of fiddling around. Okay, but the main reason why I made this, when you finish this and then look at it again, is because I want to blur the stuff that is close from the camera, and I want only the cubes which are close to the camera to be sharp, to even get more feeling of depth. So I insert another operator, and that is called Luma Blur, this one. This one again has two inputs. One of them is my image that I want to apply the effect to, and the other one, it expects a black and white image to say how strong the effect is. So I just take my depth and pull, put this into the second input. And then let's look at the parameters. And this is a, quite a thing you will find often. So you have one input, which is like your image. Uh, and the second input expects like a black and white image. It just says how strong is the effect or how transparent is the image. Whatever this, the black and white image basically is just a controller for the effect. So in our case, you start seeing what's happening if you, uh, this is like a Gaussian blur. You can adjust it to the black value and to the white value, and the black filter width and the white filter width. So we want the white parts of this image because the whiter it is, the further the cube is away from the camera. So we want to change the white filter width and crank it up really bad so we really see what's happening. And now you see that this blur filter is applied very much to the areas which are white, which are away from the camera and not at all to the areas which are close to the camera. 
Now I might find that this is ugly, and I would just add a level and try if I like it more if I invert the whole color scheme, but getting a lot better. So Which I could, mode is the comp one? Hmm? Which mode is um, in, uh, in the composite? In composite, in, in, in this case I took add. add. Yes, add. Yes. So I might add like an, an HSV adjust, which would allow me to change the whole color of the thing. Okay. Nee, also Edge hat jetzt hier den Parameter. Ich kann den Edge einfach voll nehmen. Dann kommen da nur diese Linien raus. Oder ich kann hier unten sagen, Comp over Input. Dann wird es da automatisch schon über Kannst du nochmal die Ja, also den Depths. I mean, I mentioned it because I like it so much, and now it's not the most transparent one. So first of all, you have to change from depth texture to 8-bit fixed. And then rearrange from camera space. And then you have to find the, the right distances. Questions? Um, well, I did not change the background. Like, you could also do a background, but here we're dealing with like a transparent image yeah, still. Yeah. And then what I do here is basically I just add the white from this over this. Yeah. So technically I'm not changing the background, but I'm yeah. <laughs> spraying white all over it. Uh -huh. Then here I blur it uh -huh. according to the steps information, and here I just invert it, just negative. And here I twist it around the color wheel. Ja, ja, ja. 
Very little side excursion. When you're dealing with a 3D space and touch designer, it can become confusing and you don't really know anymore where stuff is. Uh, but you can look at the scene also from a different viewer. So each of these windows, I can also change. Right now, we, we're looking at it from a network editor. This is this stuff. Or we could also look through, uh, through a geometry viewer, um, which then is a complete 3D view on the scene. <clears throat> and sometimes if you wonder, okay, my camera really doesn't see anything, uh, then this view helps you to find out, oh yeah, because my camera is somewhere over there and it's looking in a complete di different direction or so. <clears throat> and you can switch between those views here on the left, there's a few more. But, uh, yeah, the main view is the network editor, but there's also other ways to look into this touch designer world. Okay, so maybe um, as a last thing in this exercise, I yeah. uh, well, I want this, um, how can I change the camera to you now? Oh, yeah. I see from another yeah. angle, it's, uh, it's very Yeah. Um, so you can move the camera around, that would change the camera view, um, because we still have this look at, it will always look at this, uh, at the center of the script. Um, if you unlock it here, uh, you can also make other movements with the camera. Ah, okay, but it's, it's only if I'm not in the. Okay, um, that's actually the. Plus, you're not in the. I think this works at least. Normalerweise wird die Wahl ausschalten, jetzt wird es nicht da. 
So how do we render out stuff or how do we save stuff? So we have the an object that's called uh, the movie file out that allows us to write out images or movie clips. It's the same node. So if you put that down, you see it's empty. Um, you have several settings. The most important is up here because it allows you to say I want to render a movie or an image. And then there's two new options which I haven't used yet, so we ignore them, but they sound exciting. Uh, let's start with an image. Um, if I select an image up here um, and look down, then I find here image file type, so I can choose between the different image file types the touch designer can save. Some of them are classics like TIFF, JPEG, and BMP. Some of them are a bit more specific like um, OpenXDR and then PNG is also quite a classic. Um, important for you maybe is you can save alpha channel with TIFF and PNG and also BMP. Transparency information with JPEG you can't, but you know that already I guess. Let's for now just make a JPEG. Um, and if I go down here, if I look down here, now I have a record and a pause button. And if I go on record, this image has been written. Now, if you look at this, this looks a bit weird because it's so greenish. And this greenish means this is something that has been created by a script. Um, if you want to look at that script, you see left to all these parameters, there's usually a little cross. A plus, and that means, oh, there's more to come, more to look at. And if I unfold this, I see that the script that creates this output name is this one. This is a lot too complicated for us today, but just to illustrate it, how you construct this is basically a Python, st Python string, which puts together this name by using this number here. So you could set it up in a way that whenever you click a button or you press a MIDI button or you press a button on your keyboard, it saves an image with a new number. That's very useful if you work preparing something for customers or people you work with. You just make yourself a nice button and whenever you see something that you want to show to people, you just press that button. At the end of the day, you have this huge collection of screenshots. Um, but if you don't want to use that, this, this is the default. So this will basically just save this JPEG with that name in the root where your touch designer file lives. Uh, if you don't want to use that, um, you will find always these three icons here next to any parameter, basically. Um, they're everywhere. And they mean this one is just use plain what you write in there. Uh, this one means use Python expression, and this one means use an export if there's an export. So if you find something like that, and you're like, e Python, I don't want to have to do anything with script, just click on this gray one and the script is gone. You don't have to delete it, you can keep it there, and then later when you're ready, you can look at the script. For now, you could just say, I want to save my file here and I want to call it workshop. And then, as you are on record, so you have to record it, and then you've got the image. It's a bit like with an old tape recorder. Um, if you want to make a movie, it's a bit more complicated related to the endless looping nature of touch designer and the real-time nature. In the most simple version, you could just go and say, I want to record a movie. Um, you can choose a codec. Um, all of them have their advantages and disadvantages. Animation is a great codec to create, uh, to, to record almost perfect quality. 
at an incredible file size. This can fill up your hard disk in, in very few seconds. So in a way, it's not very recommended. Uh, Photo Motion JPEG will create a quick time with a Photo JPEG compression, which is, you can work with it, but the quality is not too great. Uh, H264 uh, is quite good. If, um, if you have an NVIDIA GPU, it will be encoded in real time. Uh, a very, very nice, good new addition is the GoPro Cineform because that's basically a ProRes for Windows. So you know that on Apple, a lot of the codec discussion stopped when there was ProRes because that's a very good working codec. So everybody's working ProRes, ProRes, ProRes. And on Windows, you're basically fucked because you can't use ProRes. Um, but now you're not fucked anymore because you can use Cineform, which is a great intermediate codec. That means is not as heavy as an uncompressed codec, but it's very optimized for working with editing software. So you can record something here in HD in Cineform and then work perfectly with that in After Effects in Premiere. You can encode it back to Cineform and so on. Really great that it's now in Touch Designer. Hub is a codec which is used uh, basically only in the real time world uh, because it allows you to play back very big video files which you couldn't play back in any other code because HUB works on the GPU, the codes on the GPU. Um, the downside is it also creates very big files, but as soon as you play back more than one or two video clips, uh, it's highly recommended to go to HUB. You may think, okay, if I encode the same H264, my two videos are 20 megabyte, 20 megabyte, no problem, my computer can handle this. Um, but if you do three of them, even if they're small, you will see frame rate goes down, it doesn't perform very well anymore. If you do the same thing with hub files, there will not be 20 megabytes, there will be like one or two gigabytes, whatever, but they will be able to play five of them at the same time. And that's because they don't go through the CPU, but they go through the GPU, and the GPU is working parallel, so it can handle several of these processes at the same time. Now, Whereas the CPU, you can correct me if that's wrong, but that's my personal interpretation of things. The CPU has to do things in a row. So if it has to decode five movies, it has to look at the first, the second, the third, whereas a hub can be handled all at the same time. So even if an H264 is small and looks good, you can't, uh, as soon as you handle more of them, it becomes impossible. And that's what hub is for. Hub Q is like Hub, just with better quality. I don't know anything about H.264. This is new fashion stuff. I wait for next year <laughs> until I bother with it. And I guess it can have can, can get as small as like the 265, so that you can have the 10 instead of 80. Okay. So. And uh, the last thing is GIF. You can make animated GIFs. Um, yeah. Well, actually, there's Hub Alpha who does that, but I think in Touch Designer it's only Hub Q who does Alpha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then it becomes really big. Yeah. If you like, and now for any kind of the other, like 4K movie for half minutes was 40 gigabytes, like the output. And then you think the oh, touch design I can handle it, but before the agents getting like running real time, just just creating this event data is crazy, like you get them three or four of them, it takes ages to compile the, the hub then. And the uh, actually the rendering and output, if you're if you don't want to go into that one, uh, okay. which becomes even more attractive since Adobe dropped uh, support for QuickTime, so you cannot use the new Adobe Media Encoder anymore to encode hub files, so you have to go to FFmpeg, which seems to be painful, but with Touch Designer you can encode, for example, from Cineform into hub, that would be like a very professional workflow. I mean, you can install the, the hub coder into the media coder that's 
So, like if you have an architect project and you can just run it and direct in the map, okay. but it just takes ages. Right? Well, touch design is not the worst way to yeah. uh, convert but things to happen. If I have here, for example, the, the, the C uh, version, so it's like limited to 1280, or is it? Yeah. yeah. So I couldn't, I couldn't like uh, just throw an HD movie and uh, add no resolution. Okay, so let's finish this by recording a little movie. Um, so we said we want a movie, we set a name, we chose the photo motion JPEG codec, so that's quite reliable and not too heavy. Um, we want to have some audio with it. Um, so I just opened audio file in, which opens, which allows me to uh, play back an audio file. In that case, it already comes playing the touch designer hymn. Um, and I can say the movie clip that it should record the audio from here as an MP3. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Um, so now we could just start recording out of the running thing. So now it starts writing this movie to our hard disk. And when we stop record, it stops. And to make to verify that this is, has happened, we can open it uh, with a movie file in, which allows us to load media from the hard disk. So I see there's the movie that we just recorded. Um, good, that works. So now there's a problem that will come up. Um, it will come up more and more the more load we have actually on our scene. And maybe we want to create anyway something that doesn't run in real time with Touch Designer. So I can create like a very great 4K animation in Touch Designer, uh, but it will not run at 30 frames per second anymore. But I still want to use it. So there's a way to render stuff really frame by frame, like in After Effects or in 3D software. Um, what we did now is we did a live recording. So if we have frame drop in a real-time scene, we will have frame drop in the recording. If we have frame drop in the recording, the audio will sound stupid and so on. Um, so in most cases, this just recording from a scene running in real time is not going to get the highest quality result. So the good thing with touch designers is that we can also offline render. Uh, so how we would do that is quite simple. We turn off the real time up here. And now we're not running in real time mode anymore. Now it runs as fast as it can, right? If it can run faster than 60 frames, it will run faster. Uh, maybe. Maybe. Or maybe it's, it, 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 it stops at the target frame rate, but if I go now down, if I do something very processing intensive, like the thing that I'm going to do now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I prefer the SSAO for these kind of things. So the SSAO is a screen space ambient occlusion. It's like a very expensive effect, expensive in performance. It's almost guaranteed to bring your frame rate down if you um, take it to the right settings where it actually starts looking good. Oh. What is this? Why? Why? It's not right. Yeah, it looks broken. Anyway, let's just do something to make the. Let's do the pack. Okay, let's use the hawk. The hawk has basically only one function it fucks up your uh, performance. 
to test what happens if the performance gets really bad. So now we, we only reach 14 frames per second. Mm -hmm. So if we would render this real time now, we would still write with 30 frames per second, but only every 14 frames we would get a new image, so we would get a totally choppy image. Um, if we turn real time off and record a movie, uh, it will just wait until the frame is rendered and then save it. So even if the scene only runs at 14 frames per second, when we turn real time off, it will still render a perfectly smooth movie. Basically, this is the only way how you get a perfectly smooth recording unless you record it on an external source. Because even if your scene runs nicely at 60 frames, once you start the recording, have to encode the video and write it to your art disk at the same time while you might be reading content from that same art disk and so on. Uh, it's very highly likely that if you start the series recording, your frame rate's not going to hold up. That's why you uh, are very well to just record this not in real time mode and get like a perfect recording of that just by. Um, one thing is, if you don't change the name here, every time you do record touch designer, it will record into the same movie clip. So that's why now, to see this, I just have to say reload, and it will see the new movie. Where's this bloody hog here? I mean, in general, this real-time mode is important if you work with audio, because audio needs also to keep up a certain frequency, um, or everything that has to do with time, because if real-time is on, time has the priority, then two seconds are definitely two seconds. If you turn real-time off, two seconds can be five seconds, can be two seconds, whatever it needs to calculate every image into the quality that you actually want. Um, but for if you're purely visually performing and you get stuttering image, it can be totally all right to turn real time off. Then you might have like a bad frame rate, but it still looks very smooth because you don't drop any frames. Whereas real time, in the worst case, it will always keep up time, but then maybe it will only make five minutes, uh, five pictures per second. So, I would say it's time for a little break now. Or if you have questions, also, no questions. Real time also yeah, if you do audio processing, it's very important that you keep the time. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, if you turn real time off, the audio will become stuttering. Uh, yeah, because for the video, I mean, in the image, you not necessarily see if it's now running at 60 frames or at 50, but in the audio, you'll definitely hear it because we'll skip points of time that the audio needs. Um, it's probably not true if you use all your images to touch the designer, but if you write with all your files, then you need a persistent time. Um, there is like possibilities to trick around again. So if you have like one scene that is heavy on surfacing on video, um, uh, and you want to work with audio, then you can run two touch designers. You can let one do yes. all the visual rendering and that can go down the frame rate sometimes. And you have another one which doesn't look, don't do any rendering, you just place the audio and that one will keep up the frame rate. Because such design is not multi-threaded, so if only you get an eight cross processor, it only uses one. That's a disadvantage, but it also means if you have three touch designs open, each of them will get another core of the multi-core. Basically, you can work quite well with two or three instances of touch designs that talk to each other. And then if one does some heavy loading, it will make it stop. But though you do the loading in the one, it's just an artificial outcome.
So you can separate it to different instances and that way work right around the performance problems. Best best working